Good morning, Tallahassee. It's time to wake up War Chant on 97.9 ESPN Radio. Now, here's your host, Aslan Hajavandi. It's Wake Up War Chant right here on ESPN 97.9. You already know my name. He's Corey Clark joining us as always. Corey, how are you, man? I'm good, buddy. How are you? Good. You know, I asked you this question one time. Uh, I needed to ask to you again for some clarification. How come you don't have like a middle initial? Why don't you go by Corey S. Clark? Well, I always thought it sounded a little pretentious. The uh, people that go with like, you know, I could have been... Corey S. Clark. I could have been C. Scott Clark. Ooh. I could have been C. S. Clark. It's funny when I was becoming a uh, when I was a young sports writer, I really did I don't know, have an internal debate for about 20 or 30 minutes. Like, okay, what's my name going to be? Which is ridiculous. Who, who else has, whatever, what other uh, occupation do you figure out okay, what am I going to be known as? Am I use my middle initial, my first initial, both initials, maybe my last initial? So that was a bizarre uh, moment in the in the life of Corey Clark. And also, Corey Clark, I think, is a pretty good name for a sports writer. It's got a nice little flow to it. It is. So no, I never came close to being Corey S. Clark or C.S. Clark. I worked with a dude in Montana who put his middle initial in his name, and I'm just, I was. What kind of, let me ask you, what, what kind of guy was he? It fits the mold of the guy you would think that would put his middle okay. initial in his that's name. What I that's that's what know. I was worried about. I didn't want to be that guy. Yeah, that guy was that guy. You're not that guy. That's why we like you, because oh, no. you're that guy. Uh-oh. You're the good guy. I'm so much more. Yeah, definitely. Uh, folks, as always, this show brought to you by For the Table Hospitality. Three great locations, all in College Town, Central, Township, Madison Social. Go check them out. It's hard to imagine you'd be disappointed. They're always great. I need to go check out Trivia Tuesdays at uh, over at Madison Social, but there was a baseball game yesterday, which kind of a uh, you know threw a wrench into that. Corey, we should like we should challenge people. I feel like maybe like make an appearance once a month at Madison Social where we challenge all the peasants to come challenge you know come get some in trivia. Oh, in trivia. Okay, I thought you meant just challenge them to fights. <laughs> no, um, no, which we could do. You know, the thing with it, if if they have the right category. You know, there's there's some categories or subjects where there's nobody in the city that can beat me in trivia, but there's other ones like you know, the the good girl, the good wife, or Shameless, which I've watched Shameless, but I don't know enough trivia about it, which I would have no chance. Yeah. But I love trivia, man. Trivia is trivia is fun. We should we should talk to those folks see if they want to do something where they try to stump stump the B average. See if you can if you can ace the B average. You're really trying on the B average, huh? You're trying Dad to make that it, go. Man. Come on, man. <laughs> I was so proud of myself, and you, told, you took away all my hopes and dreams on that, man. Uh, I mean, anyway. we're just the wake up war show yeah. guys, right? Yeah. All right, we'll take that, I guess. So, uh, anyhow, yeah. Last night, Florida State uh, five to two winners over USF. Uh, they broke things open in the eighth inning with four runs. Stephen Wells uh, doubled down the third baseline to uh, get the eventual you know, proved to be the game tying run. I hate how that all works out. It, it put them ahead, uh, and then they you know tacked on runs due to walks and hit by pitches. So uh, they're looking good. They're looking really good right now. Four up and four down for the Knowles. They're 4 no. They'll take on Troy this weekend. Three games set starting Friday, 4 o'clock. Tyler Holton, though, his status, we still don't know anything on. It sounds, I guess there are some mumbles. Ira posted something on the baseball message board that it does not sound very encouraging right now. And after the game, 11 pretty much said, to his understanding, they're going to... Uh, analyze it or they're going to give it one more look uh, today and then they should know by late afternoon Wednesday what they're going to do. Uh, That sounds very ominous. It doesn't feel very optimistic for Tyler Holton right now. No, it doesn't. You know, the first uh, set of eyes that looked at the MRI did not have good news. So they're getting a second opinion to see if maybe that person sees something different and hopefully has better news. But no, it at least initially, the, the the initial indication is, man, it's 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 bad, and that's just a it's just such a devastating, not just a blow to the team because you're losing one of the best pitchers in the country, but to him, uh, you know, he came back for his junior season. You know, he turned down a a pretty sizable chunk of change. It wasn't seven figures, but he turned down a sizable chunk, 
and then uh, gets injured four innings into his uh, junior junior season. That's a that's a crushing blow for him. Local kid made good, and then obviously a, a huge loss if it, it turns out to be an elbow injury, a season-ending elbow injury. That's a huge loss for Florida State. Not just because you're losing your best pitcher, like I said yesterday, but you're losing your first baseman. I mean, you're losing essentially two starters with one injury. So that's a real, it's a real tough blow for Florida State. And I was thinking about in the press box. I was like, you know, they could shut him down for for TJ for Tommy John surgery, but could he come back in two or three months and start swinging the bat? But I, I feel like, I mean. There's no way, right? Because, I mean, his future, they think, is going to be as a pitcher, so they're going to totally focus all their energy on getting him right and, and getting him ready. So, Well, and I, it's it's interesting. So we'll just do worst case that they actually get uh, confirmation of what they're scared of and that it might end up being the Tommy John surgery. So you shut it down now. Well, you're not going to be yourself. I mean, we've seen Kobe Johnson. It took a long time. Two years but nearly. Tyler Holton might not be good again, you know, feeling right for 16 to 18 months. Well, okay, so what does that do is draft status? And But would you come back? I mean, he'll still get drafted if he's available. I think some teams would take a chance on him, assuming he's going to get healthy and rehab correctly and come back as good as he was. So I assume he'd still get drafted. But where? When? What are, what are teams going to offer a guy that's coming off Tommy John surgery? He doesn't have a ton of leverage. So is he going to try to come back and pitch? For a senior season, you know the whole thing is just—it's really a—it's really a tough deal for a for a good kid, a local kid. It, you just your heart goes out to him and to the team, quite frankly, because I really you you've seen these first four games with the arms they have, man. It it could be a nice team and a really special team. It just it really hurts it when you if you're going to lose your ace. Yeah, I mean, there's there's no way to. I mean, you can silver line it in the fact that the team that went to Omaha last year didn't seem to have nearly the talent in pitching or the depth in pitching that this team has. So if, if last year's squad made to Omaha, then, then why can't this team? And, uh, you know, last year's season was obviously, you know, just totally up and down all the way until, you know, I mean, the postseason practically. I mean, they, they turned it on there uh, in, in the regional round mm-hmm. and, and then got things going. So a uh, tough break, but obviously hopefully we should know more. Go to warchant.com if you already are not. Actually, if you're listening to this in the morning, uh, just focus on work and just making it through, just putting one foot in front of the other because it's it's like 6.05 in the morning and you're just trying to survive. Yeah, guys, again, I'm going to say it every time we bring up the time. What are we doing? What are we doing up? Come on, gang. But, again, you, you guys are the productive members of society. They make You make the world spin. You get up. You get your kids food. You get them ready for school. You get to work maybe by 8 o'clock. I admire that, and that's not sarcasm because that's just not in my DNA. So, God bless everyone for listening to this at six oh eight in the morning. They're Atlas, like just just don't shrug, guys. You're you're holding all of us up. So if you guys shrug, everything right. goes downhill. Speaking of shrugs, Corey, man, your uh, the first part of the Jimbo Chronicles went over pretty. Uh, <laughs> you like that name? Uh, yeah. Did you like Jimbo Chronicles? Did you think that was a good name for it? You know, with my name being Aslan, anytime I hear the word Chronicles, I feel like you know. It's about me. <laughs> Sorry, it's a sort of subject. No, My bad, buddy. I mean, I'm sure we could have probably given it like a really super cool name, but at the end of the day, it's you know, it just chronicles the good and the bad of Jimbo. So you had to go first, brave man. You had to run torch. <laughs> I did. I was the you're, canary in the coal mine. You're Magellan trying to figure out this uh, if this <laughs> globe was uh, round after all, and uh, lots of feedback on that. Obviously, some good, some bad. Uh, did you did you look at it at all? I know you don't like reading what people have to say a lot of times, but did you hop in there uh, feet first into the tribal council and see what was going on? Of course not. Not for something like that. Really? I mean, I, really? I was going to write. Th- there was nothing that was going to change if anybody had anything negative or positive to say. Uh, but also I was on the road a lot last night, yesterday and tonight. So I wasn't in front of a computer much, but no, I, I saw that I had a lot of views and a lot of replies. So I was like, okay, well, that's kind of the point of this thing is to get people talking and that it seems to have worked. So what was the, uh, you read it. What was the gist of the, of the feedback? Uh, I would say an overwhelming majority. It was an eye opening or not so much eye opening, but a reinforcement of the innuendo that people had put down on the boards was the fact that he just simply was a very difficult 
ornery, abrasive human being, especially towards the end of things. But the crazy thing is, you know, you put in there that you had a, a moment. I don't want to give the story away because you have to pay to read these things. But there was there was <laughs> that's a, right. Good call, buddy. There was a moment. It's that, worth reading, folks. Yeah, and Warchant.com is a great website. There was a moment that you chronicled in the Jimbo Chronicles that predates the national championship. So there's so many folks that want to put this on. Jimbo had personal issues that superseded football that made him into who he ultimately became towards the end of his tenure at Florida State. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, did you read the story? Did you see the number, the year that Corey is referencing? And do you realize when Florida State defeated Auburn in a national title game? Your theory, people, does not add up. So I didn't want to dive in and throw that down on folks. But, I mean, by and large, there's obviously the segment of, why are we still talking about this guy? This is right. I saw somebody on YouTube uh, comment on the podcast from the other day that this is the equivalent of getting remarried and then talking about your ex-wife in front of your current wife and saying good things about your ex-wife. Why don't we just move on already? That would probably about be 20% of the replies. And the other 80 were just, man, I didn't realize it was this bad. Good riddance. Why didn't it happen sooner? Things of that nature. Yeah, nobody was, yeah. there wasn't a lot of like, Corey, what are you doing? It was just, it was just those, the crazy minority being the crazy minority. Well, and, and as we talked about um, yesterday, it's, it's a, it's a fun, I line to write something like that. And again, it, it wasn't my idea, um, obviously, but Gene had asked me to write a couple paragraphs, like a good and bad of my interactions, because I do think, as we point out in the piece, you know, War Chant has a pretty, I don't know, it's pretty amazing that we have three people that were here for the entire Jimbo run, from his very first year as offensive coordinator to him resigning before Louisiana Monroe game. Ira, myself, and Gene were all on the beat the whole time. And we all had relationships with Jimbo. We weren't friends with him, but we had relationships with him because over the course of 10 or 11 years, you get to kind of know someone when you deal with them at least once a week. So it was just an odd, it was an odd thing to write because I did have good times with Jimbo. I did have a, I think out of the guys on the beat over the course of his tenure, I would say Tom D'Angelo, who, who worked for Palm Beach Post, still does, but doesn't cover Florida State anymore. And myself, probably, I think, had the two best relationships with Jimbo. I think he, I, I always got the impression, and, and I got the impression from other people on the beat, that he liked Tom and I the most, um, or Tom and me. The golden child, right. the golden children. Uh, yeah, so, and I don't know why, but he did. And, you know, I go into it a little bit in the piece on why, you know, I just love talking ball with him off the record. It was just, I wasn't trying to get any inside information i mean i would occasionally but about quarterback battles or recruiting or anything like that i just i just love talking college football with the guy so i had a cordial relationship with him obviously the last year i didn't once i became a columnist which didn't happen until 2014 i wasn't really writing a lot of opinions so i was just a beat writer and i shouldn't say just i don't want to diminish it but when you're a beat writer you're not writing opinions you're writing game stories and you're writing features you're not really espousing opinions and questioning the head coach. Well, I started doing that in 2014, and our relationship changed a little bit, as you can imagine. But I had a pretty good relationship with him overall. He was, other than this past year in the press conferences and that the argument that you mentioned a few minutes ago, I, we were real cordial with each other. But the problem is you would always hear how he was with other people. And, again, as I, as I pointed out in my piece, I don't want to – I don't want to expose people. I don't want to break their confidence or their trust by actually giving specific examples of things I've heard because it would be pretty easy for Jimbo or someone else to put two and two together and know who told me one of these stories. But you just heard so many of them about just how he wasn't, he wasn't great to people behind the scenes. And that's the reality of it. And, but he also did a lot of great things, and I think that's what we're trying to do with this, the, the Jimbo Chronicles is point out, okay, yeah, it ended terribly, and yes, he could be described as a maniac behind the scenes, but he also had some very good moments with all of us, and he had a great run as the head coach at Florida State, and none of that should be forgotten. It's all a collective. It's all part of who he was and what made him who he was, and it kind of led to his downfall. 
it's what made him great. It's what also made him burn. It seems every bridge in town. It's a, uh, it's just something that uh, it's, it's a beautiful disaster all in one thing. We're going to keep trudging through this. <laughs> so uh, hunker down, everybody. We're going to bring in Gene Williams in the next segment to discuss his part in the Jimbo Chronicles. It's Wake Up War Chant. We're coming right back after this. Warchant.com, your ultimate seminal sports source, knows now is a time of true excitement for Knoll fans everywhere. That's why Warchant.com is especially proud to announce its newest team member, senior writer Corey Clark. Combine Corey's expertise with owner Gene Williams and managing editor Iris Chaffel, and Warchant.com boasts nearly 50 years of experience covering the team you love. It's Tagger time in Tallahassee, and that means now is the perfect time to sign up for your free 30-day trial. From National Signing Day to March Madness, Warchant.com is your your ultimate seminal sports source. Welcome on back to Wake Up War Channel on this Wednesday. I'm Aslan. We're joined now by the founder, administrator, all sorts of titles, all sorts of hats worn by Gene Williams. If you don't unplug from the internet, you know him as only as dot com. But Gene Williams joining us now on Wake Up War Channel. Gene, how are you, man? Not too bad, Aslan. How you been, man? It's the first time we've been able to do the show together. It's pretty uh, pretty special. Yeah, man. Thanks for bringing me a uh, quote home. Thanks for bringing me back home. Man. It's <laughs> good to be back. Hey, good to have you, man. And uh, you will get, you know, I know you like to mention those sponsors. I got to tell you, you got to chip out for Centrale, fantastic pizza, and then the township, man. They got some good sausage and a lot of nice meats over there. Yeah, for the table hospitality, they bring you this segment and every single segment here on Wake Up Warchant. Is it Centrale? Is that how you pronounce it? I, I like to call it Centrale. I think it is okay. Centrale, but I, okay. I like to put the E on the end. I got you. Yeah, I always add some flair there. So, all right, Gene, right now, Warchant is, is burning up right now on the message boards, especially the Tribal Council, where the, the first part of the Jimbo Chronicles was posted by uh, Corey Clark on Tuesday morning. This is kind of a uh, some background, I guess, on on maybe not so much how things went south for Jimbo, but rather just who Jimbo really was. And, and it's kind of been a, a weird thing for me to read because I was outside the bubble. You guys, you, Ira, Corey, were here the whole time, obviously, when Jimbo was here. So I kind of had this you know, fantasy image of how cool of a guy Jimbo was. And there seems to be a lot of other things that were underlying towards the end of his tenure that uh, might have not uh, represented him in, in such a great light. Yeah, it's uh, but there were some cool things, too. And I, I know Corey shared some stories and I do it in, in my part that's going to be up today. And, and first of all, we're doing it, this is a when I first spoke to Ira about this and we've kind of bat around it, a lot of different ideas. What's the best way to approach this? So we're going to do a three part series that we're in the middle of now, just kind of highlighting our experiences, the good and the bad with Fisher. And then I think Corey and Ira, they're going to do a little bit more kind of like how things went so well. That first part, you know, from kind of 2010 to 2000. 13, 14, and then kind of how things went to kind of started going downhill. Then I'll probably wrap it up kind of what happened maybe at least in my opinion the last couple months but yeah you know that's a thing it, it's not all i know some people just want to throw fisher completely under the bus and it would be easy to do that but there really were some great times i know you've pointed out aslan you've gotten some crap for it but you know he did a lot this program was really messed up when he took over in 2010 and obviously won a national championship which i think is maybe one of the best college teams in the last 50 years i mean they were unbelievable that year and, and jimbo fisher put that together he gets credit for that and i had some had some fun times i mean and Corey brought this up man there was nobody better to talk to and you want to talk football with him and he would some of those times especially early on as head coaching he'd pull you aside and he'd start talking x's and o's or he'd talk football history man it was like ef hut man you just stopped and you listened and you soaked it up because he, he was a special cat when it came to uh, football and i don't know if i've ever met anybody he can you can ask him 1985 who was the backup left tackle at Florida State? He would know that, and he'd know the stats. He'd know all that kind of stuff. You're like, how? How does he wasn't even here? How does he know that stuff? So, in that respect, a pretty neat guy. Keen Williams joining us here on Wake Up War Chant discussing the Jimbo Chronicles, a three-part series that started on Tuesday, will be ongoing today with a story from Gene himself. So, Gene, you know, I, I guess if, if Florida State fans could be stuck at an airport on a layover, they'd love to be able to sit at a bar next to you and kind of, you know, bend your ear to all sorts of things they want to talk about when it comes to Florida State. What made you guys want to go ahead and, and kind of delve into this stuff and, and kind of empty out the old stories about Jimbo? Because there's so many things that fans want to know about, you know, the inside story stories, if you will. And some of those things you guys can't obviously divulge, but why did you guys decide to go ahead and, and kind of let this one rip and, and, and kind of open up uh, what you guys knew about Jimbo in this sort of fashion? 
Well, first, I think we're in a real unique position here at War Champ because myself, Ira, and Corey, we, we've been here the entire time going back to when Jimbo Fisher's an offensive coordinator. No other, not, not to draw shade on anybody else, but no one has that kind of resource. So it's unique that we've had somebody, we've had our whole staff here for the entire time to be able to cover this air. And there's so many layers. You know, at first when he was forced out, resigned, whatever you want to call it, you know, I, I mentioned some people on the board said, heck, well, you know, we'll, I'll look back and kind of talk about what maybe happened down the stretch. And I sort of think, you know, this is so complex and there's so many sides of this. And I think we really need to have a multi-part feature in all the aspects of Jim Fisher because it really is fascinating. Uh, all the different things he did, uh, how he interacted with people, the good and the bad, and then finally how things kind of fell apart at the end. So I, I think it's fair to him and to his time here to cover all of that, the good and the bad, and not just let loose and talk about how things were awful the last couple months because they really were. It, it was it was a pain covering this team. It was not fun to be around him. You could tell I don't think the players or anybody in the administration like being around him. Uh, but I don't think that's representative of his whole time here. So I, that from that perspective, yeah, we really want to just cover all the bases. And again, we were in a unique perspective to really touch base on all that. So these stories are being posted on the Tribal Council, which is only available to members of WarChant.com. Obviously, you being the uh, astute businessman you are, you're not going to give everything away. But is, <laughs> is there anything that, that kind of stood out that's going to be uh, in that piece that's, that will be up later today on WarChant.com about your experiences kind of dealing with Jimbo that, that you'll always kind of remember or resonated with you? Yeah, there's. Uh, I basically talk about, I think, about three things that are really positive experience and then about three uh, not so much ones. So I'll, I'll share a good and a bad one here with you. And the, the good one really, it's probably the, the thing that I was most happy and thrilled that Jimbo Fisher did. And I think I, I want to, I'm trying to figure out the year. I think it was about 2012 or 13. My father was up for the weekend and one of those Saturday practices. You've been out to those, Aslan. You, you know, back in the day, you get the coach coming off the field. Yep. And back then, Coach Fisher would talk to us. And my dad came out and he just, you know, stood out there. You have the, the little area of the practice field, and you walk out towards the locker room. So he had our interview, and I got sometimes I got to walk off with Jimbo Fisher and just chit chat. And you know, we're walking off, say, "Hey, any chance you can come over? Just say hi to my dad, shake his hand. He'd really appreciate that." So he came over, shook hands with my dad, and didn't just do the typical. And you see this a lot of times: shake him on the hand, pat him on the back. Hey, thanks for coming out. You know, nice to meet you, and then walk off. He st- he took probably 10, 15 minutes. Spoke to my dad in depth about football. My dad, growing up in Columbus, big Ohio State. Don't hold it against my dad. Oh, he grew up an Ohio dude. State fan. I've kind of beat it out of him. He's now a Florida State guy. <laughs> well done, well done. But um, his family was close with Woody Hayes and all them, and you know, just sharing stories with Coach Fisher about the old Ohio State days and Woody Hayes and all those things. And I, my dad just was beaming after that. That the head coach of Florida State took all this time to talk to me about it. I. I called Fisher up the next day and thanked him profusely about that, how he made my dad's day. And it was it was really cool that he did that. So I will always be thankful that he did that. You know, but the, and that was an example of one side. What a gracious guy he could be at one point. And that's something you would expect from Bobby Bowden. Bobby Bowden did those things all the time. And everybody that interacted with him always had that story. There, unfortunately, there weren't enough of those with Jimbo Fisher, but that was one time that he did something. And then the other one, and I, I went through it pretty detailed in the in the story that's up on War Chant, but the first interaction I had with him that was a, a let's say not so friendly uh, experience was we'd written a story after Jameis Winston committed about Sean McGuire's reaction and to Sean McGuire's credit the kid couldn't be more gracious I mean he said I can't wait for the competition this is great for the class and I put the quote of what he said in the story in my version so you can kind of see what he said and I got a, a first call from Damian Craig real mad at me and I couldn't really understand why he was upset and then Jimbo called me up and just lit me up, absolutely blistered me for how dare I write a story like this and put a kid in that position. He goes, and he pulled the old, he did, he liked to pull this, well, you know, what was that, what if that was your kid? And I go, well, I'd be proud of my kid because he, he handled it maturely. He gave great answers and it made him look like a team player and everything else and he lost it. Uh, and he just completely ripped me a new one at that point. So, you know, I let him vent, and by the end, we were fine. He had settled down, and we still had a very well-working professional relationship after that. It never affected anything. But it really kind of showed you, you know, the two sides of Jimbo Fisher. And that's one thing I wanted to get out of this series to point out. It's not all bad. It's not all good. He he was an odd guy, you know, but he could, when he lit somebody up, boy, you knew it. You felt like you were just tore down and beat up afterwards. 
All right, folks, go to WordChant.com, check out that piece from Gene, and then tomorrow we'll have somebody from Ira, and then uh, uh, the series will, will on go with another few pieces with the Jimbo thing. So we can, some folks, hopefully they'll think that'll, that'll close a chapter on Jimbo. They can, you know, no longer hear about him. But uh, again, as Corey and I mentioned, uh, he's part of history when it comes to Florida State. He's part of the fabric of the school. So it, it's, it's, car, it's hard just to kind of erase him out of things. But uh, as we let you go here, Gene, we've got about one minute left here. It's, it's day two now of the chase uh, for Florida mm-hmm. State and their offseason conditioning program. You know, obviously, I know you guys want to get a hold of Willie. We want to get a hold of Willie and kind of talk to him. But what are you kind of uh, hoping to see or maybe hear from from what they're going to get out of, of, of the chase? And I guess what's your thoughts on it being called the chase? You know, the whole thing is right. They're, they're going to chase excellence and then or, or chase greatness and then get get excellence on the way up uh, up to the top. Well, I love it because, you know, he's got to bring, you know, Coach Fisher was fourth quarter Brills, and I think it was good for him to kind of rebrand that and then uh, bring it in the chase. And it's it's a different because it's first thing in the morning, and I feel sorry for the kids having to probably get up at five in the morning and get their butts out there. But, again, it's a culture change. And, you know, when we – and I'm hoping he'll give us some access, and it seems like we will probably will, and I'd like to get out there. Even if I get – you and I got to get up. I know you're not Easy. a morning person either. Easy. But Don't get carried away now. Yeah, yeah, we got we, we got out there. It'll be worth it. But, you know, I want to see the culture change take effect and a little bit of interactions we've had with everybody in this new staff. They're so different, and the culture is so 180 from Jimbo Fisher. And I want to see how that transition takes place among the team. And I think it's going to be fun. And it, it's a good. I, I think it'd be more difficult to go from a. I guess you can call him. A, 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 a player's coach but i think it's more of just more excitement letting kids be kids and i think it's a lot easier to go from jimbo fisher type system a saban-esque to that than vice versa i think kids would have a harder time adjusting so i think they'll soak up this culture and this change pretty quickly but i'm looking forward to seeing that firsthand gene williams founder administrator of warchant.com thanks for joining us we appreciate it gene and thanks, Aslan. Keep up the good work, buddy. Ah, thanks a lot, man. Checks in the mail or just, just take it out of my paycheck this time around. <laughs> you got it. All right, don't go anywhere, folks. We'll be right back after this. More Wake Up War Chant coming up right after the break. You're locked in to Wake Up War Chant on 97.9 ESPN Radio. Back out of here on ESPN 97.9. It's Wake Up War Channel. I'm Aslan. He's Corey Clark. This show brought to you by For the Table Hospitality. College Town, go there. Throw a dart. You'll probably hit one of these three great locations. Mass and Social, Central, and Township. Uh, visit them. Be plentiful. Have good times. And then maybe on a Tuesday, you can witness Corey and I destroy you, your hopes and your dreams and trivia. <laughs> one of these, one of these Tuesdays, get ready. Depending on the, if it's the right category, holy moly, I'm going to bring hell with me when it comes to that trivia. Is shut, all I'm saying. Shut it down. Shut it down. <laughs> all right. So uh, the chase on going for Florida State. You just heard from Gene talking about the old coach. Corey spoke about the old coach in the first segment, and I don't want to talk about him anymore. Yeah, I mean, listen, the only follow up question I was really going to have, and we've already talked about, it, is just. Do you have to be like an SOB to be a successful coach? I mean, you could talk about, I mean, you can cite all the good coaches right now at the top of their game in most professional sports. And I would imagine a lot of the people around them probably have stories about them being a jerk at one point. Yeah, probably. But you also, you know, maybe, maybe different sports. I mean, Mike Martin, you could argue, you can't argue it's, it's fact is one of the best college baseball coaches of all time. He's about to break an all time wins record. I wouldn't, dare think anyone's called him an SOB. Um, they've probably been mad at some of the decisions he's made, but he's a, he's a nice man. Um, Steve Kerr seems like a legitimately nice person. Uh, it's Dabo. W- Willie Taggart. Stop yeah, I, poking I holes in my theory. From man. Willie Taggart. Jeez. So you can, but I think, I, I do think, you know, some, some people are just wired that way. And it's not so much of being an SOB as, Man, I just don't care about your feelings. I am so singularly focused on what I'm trying to do that I want it done my way. I want it now. If you don't know what I want, then I'm going to be mad at you for that. And I do not care about your feelings one iota. And that's because I get paid a lot of money to win games, and there's a lot of pressure on me, and I'm trying to do everything I can to make sure we win games. And it's just such a singular focus that you don't step back and maybe sometimes – understand the humanity of it or the lack of humanity, I guess. And that's not a Jimbo specific thing. That's a, you know, that's a, I mean, it's a societal thing really. Um, and it's also just uh, I think it's a head coach, a head football coach 
uh, thing. But again, it's not just specific to football. It's all there are those types of coaches and those types of CEOs all through all walks of life. But there's there's more than one way to do that. There's a Jimbo and there's a Dabo. Well, you know, they're both successful in their own right, right? Dabo's been better, if you want to be honest. Has he uh, Dabo's, Dabo's sustained it longer, but they both won championships doing it completely different ways. Like how has is, how is Dabo sustained it longer? I mean, Dabo's window is what, 13? I mean, I, can, can you count 13? He got oh, no, he, he, won a, he won a BCS ball in 2012, and he just was in the playoff. He's been in the BSC, but he hadn't had a five and six. He's been at least 12, or he's been 11 or 12 wins every year since 2012. That's why. All right. and, and they're not showing any signs of slowing down. You know, they just got all those guys to come back. I mean, do you think Clemson's going to go 5-6 and six this year? you think they might win 11 or 12 again? Whatever. You know what stop, I mean? Stop trying to in, introduce logic into this. I mean, the thing is, if we're judging, the ACC was not very solid last year. So Florida State can get their head out of their you-know-what. If Willie gets this whole thing lit up and, and rolling again, that, that Florida State's going to be a problem for them. I mean, Florida State was a problem for them, even despite the – Struggles of the last three years, relatively speaking, with last. Oh, sure, but they won those games. And Mm -hmm. and at the end of the day, I don't know how else you would argue who has the better program than Clemson's won three in a row, been to two national championship games in the playoff this year, and aren't slowing down at all. They might be number one or number two in the country to start next season. They certainly didn't just go five and six, and they've been very good since 2012. I mean, they have. I know you know Florida State housed them in 13. Housed. and, you know, I don't know how Dabo lost that game in 14 to smag, but he did. But, man, you know, Clemson's the second-best program in the country. You, you know, they've lost, what, seven games in five years? It's it's remarkable what he's done. And, again, he got all those linemen, defensive linemen to come back, and he's got the number one or number two quarterback in the country coming in. I mean, they just recruited a high level, and they win 11 or 12 games a year. So he didn't fizzle like Jimbo did. I mean, Jim, you know, Jimbo, again, man, like I've said, he finished his career at Florida State – 17 and 12 in his last 29. Dabo hadn't lost 12 games this decade. So, and that's not true. That's a hyperbole, but it's not far off. Dabo just has a better program. Clemson's a better program than Florida State. The, the, the difference is Florida State's ceiling is always a little bit higher than Clemson's, I think. I think if Willie gets this thing running, it, they'll, they'll be be, they can be better than Clemson in a, in a year or two, or two or three, I should say. Two or three years, they can be a better program than Clemson, if he does well, but there's no guarantee. But, you know, again, I, I know I, we like to poke fun at Dabo. My man has the second-best program in the country. And, again, my point all along was that Jimbo won at a high level doing it his way, being the micromanager, being the, you know, the dictator, the tyrant. Dabo is not that in, in, in any way, shape, or fashion, in any of that. And he still wins, too. So there's different ways to do it. You don't have to be an SOB. But it also doesn't mean just because you're an SOB you can't win. There's, there's plenty of proof on both sides. And Dabo's team looked pretty miserable and lousy against Alabama. And Florida State actually had a lead on Alabama until their special teams went kaput. Anyhow, uh, moving along. Question. Well, right, but I mean, again. No, stop talking Dabo's about it in a positive in light, style. Corey. I'm done. I'm done with you on this. I'm done with you on this, Corey. <laughs> okay, right. sorry. Visiting, uh, revisiting a topic from the other day, Corey. Let me ask you this. If Willie goes 9-5, and 6-7, and 10-4, and four, does he come back for a fourth year? 9-5. and five, Six and seven, ten and four. Sixteen losses? No. No. That I mean, I, I can't even imagine maybe if they started out that third season two and four and then won the final eight. I, I, I just I can't imagine him losing sixteen games in three years and coming back for a year four. Those are the first three seasons of William Christopher Dabo Sweeney. Well again, but he was taken over Clemson. You know, Clemson hadn't yeah. won the ACC since what eighty one. Yeah, yeah, you know, it, they uh, they had they had well not eighty one since like eight, before Florida State joined the league. They hadn't won a national title since eighty one, but they hadn't been they hadn't been nationally relevant really since you know Bobby was beating up his kid in those Bowden Bowls. That was the only time Clemson was ever talked about. So yeah, I got that, um, and it's kind of crazy when you think about that. Number one, that he was hired at all. And then he got the interim tag pulled because he was just the wide receivers coach. And then, yeah, he lost 16 games in three years. Now, when you look at Clemson, the, the five or six years preceding that, that was kind of par for the course at Clemson. They were always a eh, nine and nine and five, you know, eight and five, seven and six, uh, you know, maybe nine and four in there somewhere. But, you know, maybe that 10 and four 
I don't remember that season at all. I don't even know what year that was. 2011. But was that 11? So yeah. they beat Florida State up there when Trickett had to play. Yep. So they saw enough that year to think, okay, we're about something's about to happen. But maybe they felt good that they had turned the corner and they were heading in the right direction, and they were right. I mean, they did. They. It's a crazy hire when you think back on it that that they hired him, and he seemed like such a goofball. And then his first three years, he lost 16 games. And then how many games has he lost sit, since? Nine? Eleven? I mean, it, it's pretty remarkable that they stuck with him, and it, and it paid off. But again, I don't think I don't think Florida State is nearly as down as Clemson was when Dabo took over. They've lost 11 games after his first three years. They've lost 11 games. I mean, that's 12. crazy, right? That's, he, they, that was a good decision to stay with them. I, I wonder if we'll show that sort of uh, patience. One thing Florida I'm State's more, lost 12 in the last three. I know, Corey. We all know. We've been there. We, yeah, we lived them. Three of them to Clemson. We've had so barely. They were all good games. Yeah. So we've had, uh, speaking of patience, we've had a lot of good questions so far over on the Tribal Council in the Renegade Express thread. I'm almost tempted to kind of dive into them here, but we'll try to hold off, I guess, until Friday. Hey, I've got a Renegade Express question for you. Okay. Okay, so I have a friend, uh, Tim Linnefeld. People probably know him. If they listen to Seminole Headlines, we talk about him a lot, and he's on Seminoles.com, and he, you might follow him on Twitter. Uh-huh. Sadly, uh, and I'm only saying this because the obituary is in the Tallahassee Democrat, and it was on Facebook. His mom passed away last week. And so he, he Facebook linked to uh, the obituary, basically saying, look, it was a rough go of it lately. I'm sad to report that my mom passed away. And then he linked to the obituary. And am I supposed to like that? You know what I mean? Like usually when somebody posts something on Facebook yeah. and you want them to know that you've read it and you care, you hit the like button. No. But I, I don't want to like that. You, you click – you click and hold down the like button, and then it'll pop open some other uh, emotion options. There's an actual like a, um, there's like a sad emoji sort of thing. To, oh, to, I could do that then. Yeah, yeah. Okay, because didn't I mean that just seemed really kind of callous to click like. Right. You know, I, you know, but I, anyway, that was just that was a question I was just I'd been thinking about last night, and I and I threw it out there. I wanted to see what get your take on it, but you gave me the the information I needed, so I'll go. Add, and go add the uh, sad emotion because I am obviously very sad. I, I lost, uh, I lost as many people know. I lost my dad six or seven years ago, and it gets easier, but it's never easy. It just isn't. It's never easy. There's, especially I don't know where I, I'll stop this train real quick. But you know, my son was three when my dad died. My son is nine now and is a sports nut, and. My dad would just get so much joy out of out of being with him and talking with him, and that makes you sad. And it's just this, you know, we it's part of life, and it's just it's a really sad deal. So Tim's not listening to this because it's too early in the morning, but um, I'm I'm not going to like your Facebook post, buddy. But I, I I'm really I'm really sorry for you. Well said, Corey. We'll be right back wrapping up the show after this. Darn pop-ups and video ads. Are you wasting your time again on clickbait FSU updates that are bloated down with ads? Yeah. And after crashing my computer, the information isn't even up to date. You're on Warchant.com. What's really going on with the Seminoles? For the real scoop, you'll need to get your own Warchant subscription. What's it cost? Free. There's a 30-day trial offer right now. You know I like free. Sign me up. Use the promo code WARCHANT30. That's WARCHANT30. Nobody has more accurate and timely information on the Knowles than Warchant.com. Warchant.com, your ultimate ultimate Seminole Seminole source. source. It's Wake Up War Channel. Maslon. He is Corey Clark. We are brought to you by Four the Table Hospitality. Three locations in College Town, Township, Central, Madison Social. At Township on Wednesday and every single Wednesday, starting at 7 o'clock, a select draft beer. They call it Weddenstein Wednesday. Corey, when, Weddenstein? It's, it's, okay. I, I'm that doing, doesn't sound like Mick Ultra. No, no. Uh, proof 85 Eight five zero pale ale or deep reef dweller a uh, dweller IPA as I'm butchering these man you craft beer people just call it something like that rolls off the tongue uh, anyhow uh, they'll offer a liter of that beer for half liter price on Wednesdays starting at seven okay. o'clock all right I assume Mick Ultra is just the same price it's steady probably just steady Eddie steady Eddie on the Mick Ultra delicious stuff um, so Corey. Yeah. 
life has become a little bit easier for you. We mentioned on the show previously that you have this great recollection, uh, a recall is the, the word I was looking for. You have great recall when it comes to remembering statistics, events of the sports variety. You'll no longer have to cram your mind with who won the 2013 national title in basketball because Louisville went ahead and had it vacated. So your life's become a little more easier this week. So I hope things are trending well for you there right now, friend. Yeah, and as we, it's preposterous. And my my feelings on this are known because we talked about it a, uh, maybe last week about how that just somewhere in the last decade that just became the punishment that the NCAA wanted was hey let's vacate, let's not like it would be one thing if they said you know what Louisville because you used you know prostitutes and 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 you had those kind of parties to lure recruits. You're not only did you not win the 2013 title, but we're going to give it to Michigan who finished second. Well, they don't do that. They just say nobody won it, and it's preposterous. What what kind of deterrent is that to say five years after the fact, hey, that championship that you all won, remember we all saw it. It was a great game. You played Michigan down to the wire, and you pulled it out. That didn't happen. Nobody won the 2003 national title. We're going to still keep the hundreds of millions of dollars that we made off it. Obviously, that's what we are as the NCAA. We have to have that money, but nobody won it. Take your banner down. It's just utter nonsense. All right. What's well, that utter nonsense is talking about football. I'm going to dive into the wake up board chant renegade express mailbag for just one question. Okay, for let's today. do it. Let's so do I, it. I think what we should do here, Corey, is if we get to 10 questions, so I'll post the thread on Sunday night. I think maybe now I'll post on Sunday night. If we get to 10 questions by, you know, Wednesday morning, we'll go ahead and do a mailbag on Wednesday. We'll put another thread and then maybe we'll have some, to do on Friday as well. Do you think that's a good idea or no? Or we should probably sure, talk about man. this. Uh, that's a great idea. Just, you know, I like, I like interacting with the, with the listeners and the readers. That's always fun. You just don't like reading what they write on your pieces, but of course not. Well, my thinking there is I'm okay talking and interact, like answering a question and giving an opinion, but once the cat's out of the horse is out of the barn, I've already written it. It's my opinion. You're not going to change it. Just like I'm not going to change yours by saying somebody says, I didn't like this Corey. I thought it was weak. And why are you doing this now? I don't want to be like, well, you do, 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 do. I mean, I just, there's no point in doing it. I just hope people like it. The more anything, I hope people are entertained by the stuff I write. That's no, all. Yeah, no one wins at those sort of arguments. All right, let's dive into it. We'll take the first question. And since it's been such a downer of a show talking about John James and other things that are not good for the soul, let's just go ahead. Dabo. And, yeah, let's just go ahead and wreck anonymous 911's uh, heart here. Okay, Aslan and Corey. With Walt Bell's history of trick plays and the skill sets of a few guys like Cam Akers and DJ Matthews, how wild and unpredictable do you see our offense getting this year? I'll go well, ahead. I'll, be, I'll, I'll throw the cold water first. Was. I'll throw the cold right. water first. Uh, I don't think, I don't know, maybe I'm still uh, battered fan syndrome of the guy before that just none of that stuff was going to happen. I don't know how much of that you... A deploy, especially in your first year. And I think a lot of the story, and I think part of it was, I think you actually reported on it. You know, Walt Bell, you know, made some sort of mention about, I've got 300 trick plays in my book. I think that was just kind of a, just to give you an insight into how, you know, excited he is about football and, and how much he loves the game. I don't think he's necessarily got it. Every team puts in one or two trick plays per game. I don't think we'll see, you know, a crazy play some diff- exotic alien formation every single week. I just, I hope we do, but I don't, I'm not bracing for it. Yeah, but I think w- there's no way we could see less than we've seen. So um, I, I do think there'll be more. I, I do think there's a chance they could do something bizarre every game. Um, certainly, you know, once every couple of games for sure. I just think, you know, I, I think there will be, I think, I, I, mean, I, I hesitate to even say it, because it was talked about so much last year, it became made fun of. But I do think you'll see sets where Cam Akers is a quarterback some. I do think you'll see, you know, things where you have, you know, three linemen way on one sideline, two linemen on the other. I mean, I just – because he is, he does do that. He loves he likes to do trick plays. He loves trick plays. And, man, this, this fan base was born on trick plays. That's how they made their name. And I, I think it's kind of cool that, that a bit of that is coming back. It won't be – you know, crazy, like the guy, the Arkansas high school coach that does a, a bunch of crazy stuff. It will be that, but it'll be, you know, it'll be different. And I do think he'll have, he'll go into his game plan every week with three or four of those types of plays in his back pocket. Now the question is how many will the, will the boss man let him use? 
Yeah, well, the boss. How many do they need to use? Well, the boss man be scared. It's his first season. Do you do you you know do you grab the bull by the horns in year number one and and go for broke? Because I mean that's kind of what you do when you're running those sets and those plays. Or will it be one of those things where you don't want to jeopardize? And obviously, the the tempo and the scores of the game will dictate those sort of things. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm just throwing cold water on things. I'm not expecting. You know, all sorts of fun, loosey goosey football out of Florida State. But then I don't know, man. Look at what he wants to do with all the jerseys. Mario Edwards Sr. tweeting out chrome helmets. You know, chrome yeah. helmets, black jerseys. Those were something. Man. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think I disagree with you a little bit. I think they will I think they will kind of um have a little more trickeration than, than what we well, I mean again, obviously well, yeah. that's gonna happen. It's gonna be way, more to take a, to. way to go I on the branch one or two there. a game. I, I do. I think you could have one or two a game. And I think if you're going to do it, this is the year to do it. Because quite frankly, He's not getting fired after his first year. This, and he can set a tone for what his offense is going to be and what his tenure is going to be if he adds some excitement like that. Now, obviously, the W's are more important than anything else. But, again, this fan base was – again, they grew up with that. And I think that would be a nice homage to pay to the guy before Jimbo. And also – I shouldn't say that. To Bobby Bowden. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I should hey, just man, refer to him as the guy before Jimbo. Come on. Um, but, yeah, yeah, I just think that I, I do expect a, a little bit – a little bit of that each game, something different, something unique each game. Heck, they're going to be running 85 plays. One of them could be a trick one. Well, again, you know, way to go out on a limb there, Corey, and saying that it's going to be more tricky than it was in the years past because the guy before hey, didn't want to do that's anything. That's how I roll. Yeah. I don't know. Again, I, every single team from Pee Wee to NFL, maybe not NFL, has – you know, they install two or three trick plays per game. Just how often do they get used? But I mean, you've seen Alabama do things. Alabama had double yeah. passes in the, you know, the national title game that they ended up losing in, in Tampa. They had the onside kick the year before. I think they did something crazy against Georgia. I want to say that I can't think off the top of my head right now, but they yeah. put in the backup quarterback after, at, at, after halftime. That counts. They didn't right? have to do that. Does that count? Way to go, Nick. Yeah, jerk. Thanks for listening, folks. Jeff Cameron coming at three o'clock. Ah, these recruiting updates are nothing but fluff. Are you wasting your time again on free blogs and social media to get the scoop on FSU recruiting? Yeah, it's all bait and switch. Get me excited with a headline, but get nothing in return. You're on Warchant.com. What's really going on with FSU recruiting? Could be another top five class, but for the real scoop, you'll need to get your own Warchant subscription. What's it cost? Free. There's a 30-day trial offer. Just sign up and you'll get full access through signing day. And nobody has more accurate and timely information on recruiting than Warchant.com. You know I like free. Sign me up. Warchant.com, your ultimate Seminole source.